Good evening. My name is Jason Wallace. I'm the pastor of Christ Presbyterian Church here in the Salt Lake Valley, and we welcome you to another installment of The Ancient Paths. Two weeks ago, last night, I met with Sean McCraney on his show, and we spent two hours going through some of the things that divide us, and basically had an opportunity to challenge him to his face, and uh, he said he also wanted to confront me about the things he said I had been saying about him. Back two years ago, Sean declared war on the churches. This is January of 2013. And we really didn't say much directly about any of that. But then in January of last year, Sean basically came out against the Trinity as a doctrine. He said that it was garbage. He said it was unbiblical that it was rooted in polytheistic paganism. I wrote to him at the time before I ever aired anything on it and told him that he was teaching grave error and I was going to have to respond. I played a number of clips showing his trajectory since he had declared war on the churches and showed clips of what he had been teaching. Sean says that I have strung together clips out of context and that I've misrepresented him. At the same time he says he's never watched the program. So I'm not sure how that goes together, but a year ago he invited me to an open forum and when I showed up it was Inquisition 2014. And instead of it being an open forum I found out that basically apparently I was one of the Grand Inquisitors because I was given five minutes notice to make a 30-minute presentation about Sean. I tried to present the truth. Sean made a number of different claims during that. He said that the three of us that were challenging him, Rob Savulka, Dale Finley, and myself, that we would kill him if we could, that we would burn him at the stake. He said that it was all over the term Trinity and that was never the issue. The issue was over the doctrine of the Trinity, not just the word Trinity. But we went through that and we moved on. But early this year, Sean had continued to, to teach very different things about the Bible. Uh, he had taught that hell was not eternal, that people eventually get out of hell. He taught that the uh, second coming was in 70 AD and that the church was all spiritual. He said that, the, that Christianity has no physical reality in the present world. And he started a new series in which he basically was going against the Bible as something that we can apply in our own day. So I took that as an opportunity to use that as an example of how people abuse the Bible. That they claim to believe the Bible and yet they don't see it as authoritative. Sean says that the things that the apostles said were only for that time and that they should not be applied to our own day. I'm not sure why you stop at how we do church, as Sean would say and things like that. Why, why not the gospel? Why not other things? So anyway, we did a couple of shows. Sean called me and wanted to come on here. We were not able to work that out, so we worked out that I would go on his show and then I would air the two hours the last two weeks, which I did. Uh, there were a few minutes of questions at the end, but we spent two hours basically showing you everything other than a couple of questions there at the end, and we did it unedited. Uh, if you want to see those last minutes, they're available on YouTube. But I have, Sean did a, a review last week of what took place, and I wanted to do a review as well. And so I invited Curtis Eggleston to join me this evening. Curtis is pastor of Berean Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Ogden, and a good brother and uh, we'll be, I don't know if we'll get to it this evening, but uh, was there at the debate and actually became uh, part of the subject of the debate. So Curtis, very good to have you with us. 
Thank you very much for having me, Jason. You know, the, the issues as I see them, uh, we have fundamental differences in terms of what the Christian life is supposed to look like. It's, you basically have this very individualistic view. Uh, rejection of the visible church, rejection of the church discipline, rejection of elders. Uh, I think that one of the taglines that Sean actually shows in his show now is no tradition, no men, just truth. Now you used to hold some positions somewhat, I mean you were never off in terms of questioning hell and things like that, but you, you used to be fairly independent, didn't you? I was very independent. Uh, in fact, I have a lot of compassion for these people. Uh, I was just like them in a very real way. I remember uh, stating things such as, I have no creed but Christ, and not even really relating what creeds were at the, in my infancy, in my uh, early Christian life. Uh, I, I had a lot in common with them. Now, when you were challenged on that, did you... Uh, did you take that as a personal attack? Uh, well, no, because uh, I was challenged by Scripture. <laughs> it wasn't anybody <laughs> else that was it's saying lot, anything to me. It's a lot more powerful to tell people to argue with God and His Word rather than to argue with, you know, individuals, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's hard to argue with God's Word when it specifically states something. Uh, when it talks about the church, where it talks about who God is, I'm, you know, uh, these things are, these are non-negotiable things that, that we ha we can't just make them up on the fly, and it's a dangerous thing to take these types of doctrines and to twist them around. You know, it's funny, Sean has his own list of non-negotiables. He came up with a list of five, and he said, you can, you can try to add some to that, whatever, I don't see how you can take things off, but there are, there are passages of Scripture that are clearly dealing with whether you're a Christian or not. Yes, there is. There are things dealing with whether you go to heaven or hell and whether you ever get out or not. And he sees those as negotiable, that, you know, we should just all agree to disagree. And it, it I mean, I hate to sound flippant, but it sounds like the Rodney King School of Theology. Can't we all just get along? Right. Um, what As someone... You used to, to pastor a group called Made Alive in Christ Fellowship. You didn't have it, you didn't have membership. Didn't have membership. Didn't have elders. Didn't. Uh, we were very similar to them, other than of course we held to the Trinity, uh, hell and right, and, uh, yeah. the elementary principles of the faith. You know, we held to them. So, I want to go through some of these things and let's talk about them. I, I see what Sean has done as not something new. Um, and I think this came out in the, the video, which I was surprised. We've had 3,500 views in just over two weeks. It was, it was posted two weeks ago last night, and we're over 3,500 views now. Wow. So apparently people are interested. Uh, I got some derisive comments on Facebook, you know, you know this is ridiculous. Why are you doing this? But we're talking about heaven and hell. We're talking about who Jesus is, what he's done. We're talking about who God is, the Father. We're talking about uh, things. That I, I can't imagine anything um, more important, and yet uh, we have a clip we're going to play later. Sean says, you know, we're here arguing about the color of God's eyes. Yeah, I heard that. I, I was very surprised. So... Over seven years ago, uh, I, I had a conversation in this room with Sean. Uh, I was, it was a mock interview, and Sean then rejected Matthew 18 as applying to the church. He said that was for a different dispensation. He rejected 1 Corinthians 5 in terms of church discipline. Even though it was to a Gentile church, he, I knew he was coming out of a dispensationalist background. But he, he said, I think we're just supposed to accept everybody. You know, from, from my perspective, that sounds loving. And we end up sounding like the voice from Mount Sinai. That's th true. Thundering, <laughs> you know, no. You right, know, right. And, 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 
you know, I've had conversations with people that have been under Sean's teaching that they see this as legalism. Yep. Uh, how would you respond to somebody like that? That this idea of church discipline, you know, you're, you're trying to get the church between you, between us and, and Jesus. Yeah, uh, really that makes no biblical sense whatsoever. The scriptures speak about God, how he manifests himself to people and how he draws them to himself. And as he does that, he gives them a new heart. And they're new creatures in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so now we have a new life in him. And so we're no longer the old man, but we, are, we walk in the newness of life that's in Christ Jesus. And we're naturally, when before, we would, would naturally sin and have no problem with it. But now, if we sin, and when we sin, we are convicted. And so we need to realize that uh, now we have a heart that cries out to God, Abba, Father, when before we did not. And the Spirit of God indwells us. And we are the temple of the Spirit of God. And so we need to realize we're new creatures in Him, and that we have a new life, and that... We want to live a life pleasing to Him. And it's not just about, uh, let's say, love, 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 even though love is extremely important and we need to love God and love our neighbor as ourselves, which we didn't do before. We strive to do now. Some of our neighbors are easier to love than others. But uh, there are specific things in the, in the Word of God that... that is a warning to us. Uh, for example, the scripture says that God's word is not open to any private interpretation. And so, and I was kind of surprised that they wouldn't relate to that because as we all know that he was involved with the uh, mission, uh, uh, mission, mission to Mormons. And they, of course, profess faith in Christ, and yet we would not accept them as brothers. He would not accept them as brothers either. And, of course, uh, when Sean would try to tell people what this... I thought Sean did a great job when it comes to exposing Mormon heresy. He was, he, uh, that was his strong point. Mm -hmm. But his strong point in dividing Scripture is lacking immensely. And so the scripture says that those in whom wrongly divide the word of God, they do this to their own destruction. And so that's a warning. And so we need to take very careful and take heed to our doctrine and what we believe. And, and the scripture says that we must rightly divide the word of God. And I would simply say that from the first century church, second, third, fourth, fifth, etc., uh, these, these people had the same Holy Spirit that we have. And that those things in which were written, I mean, we have a long path. There's a well-treaded road where the saints have marched. Yeah. And, and we don't have to get, we don't have to create the will all over again. And so, when we get into Scripture, Scripture must rightly divide. We can't just take some Scripture and tuck it under the rug and say, well, that doesn't apply to us today. Or, you know, it's got to fit. This, this you know, God doesn't f speak with a forked tongue. Yeah. I want to play a clip here. Uh, well, let me, let me comment real quickly, and then I want to go to a clip here. Um, I don't know that we have a, a, a graphic for this, but they pit, they tend to pit grace against holiness. And yet, in uh, Paul in Titus 2.11 says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We're going to get more into the, the, the nature of grace in a little bit here, because uh, I want to deal with uh, several subjects, but the point that I've tried to make to these folks, uh, I had a Christian counselor 
uh, come up to me and she said, it's obvious that you're guilty of the sin of gluttony. And that's just the same as lesbianism. Mm -hmm. I am a sinner. Everything I do is sinful. I claim no righteousness of my own. But isn't there a fundamental difference in terms of sins like homosexuality, where we see it in Romans 1, that it is, it is a judgment of God that even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gives them over to a reprobate mind. It's a, right. it's a special judgment. And it's, there are things that are listed in 1 Corinthians 6 and Galatians 5 that Paul says explicitly, those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Right. And they just they trump that with James 2.10. Well, if you've broken one law, you've broken them all. So who are you to judge? Who are you to judge? And then what do, they, what do these things mean? And they dance all around it, and they never deal with it. And Paul says, this is the line in the sand. This is heaven and hell. Yes. But anyway, I want to backtrack. Um, Sean, in terms of his um, views of uh, relig organized religion and things like this, this is nothing new. A um, year and a half ago, uh, we have a clip here where he shows uh, that basically the best Christian families are those who are void of religion, void of an external church. And I'd like to take a look at that. The question I would ask if we take the two, ver the very best LDS families and their de de devotion, and we take the very best LDS uh, Christian families and their devotion, I would ask, where's their devotion? And you will find that the LDS families, if they are good LDS families, their devotions to the church, to the prophet, to the Book of Mormon, to the Pearl of Great Price, to their temple covenants. Their devotion is to an institution and to uh, ideologies that ha they have accepted in terms of religion. But the Christian, the very best, if we're talking about the very best Christian families, they're void of religion. They, their relationship is with Christ directly, only him. And we have this, this um, war against the visible church and pastors right. uh, whom yep. he has denounced in, in the strongest terms. He says right. they're small-minded men bent on control. Uh, you know, we, when you start lining these things up, he says that uh, the church has been wrong for 1,800 years. He says, who am I to spit in the, the wind? I think he meant face of 1,800 years of Christian tradition. He says that we need a new way to do church. It needs to be spirit. And what I tried to point out two weeks ago was that implicit in what he's saying is the church didn't have the spirit for the last 1800 years. And you know, you, you alluded to this yourself. Uh, there must have been a great apostasy. And all the churches are wrong. All their creeds are heinous, to use his term. Mm -hmm. Pastors are greedy, worried about empires. Uh, their uh, churches, you know, they um, you go down the list. The um, their in a, their their education blinds them to the spirit. Uh, everybody ultimately gets glorified, and he has uh, literally said on the show that he's open to different degrees of of exaltation. And. When you add all that up, it seems like a populist version of Mormonism. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it sounds familiar, don't it? It's Mormonism without the tithing. And it's Mormonism without some of the other things. Now, um, he's, he's very clear that a non-negotiable is monotheism. So, I mean, I don't want to overstate things. But in terms of making people feel uh, righteous in their contempt for the visible church. It sounds a lot like Joseph Smith, doesn't it? It sure does. Uh, you know, like I said earlier, uh, when he stated those things about uh, LDS families, he was right on the money. Mm -hmm. But where he goes astray is where he starts talking about uh, the Christian. You know, you can't throw out the baby with the bathwater uh, where all through Scripture you'll find and, and where the, the church is an elder-led church, the Pesbruderos or the Piscopos. They're both terms 
Greek terms meaning elders. And so there's a leadership in the church. God gave some to be apostles, some to be, be prophets, some to be pastors, teachers, etc. And see, these are things that God gives, and these are evidence that the, it's the church that's God's means for his people, that they should be a part of a local body of, of believers. And to say that we shouldn't be a part of that is extreme. In fact, it's very similar to a Gnostic type of a heresy, where they just, anything physical, anything but spirit is bad. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the docetists in the early church said that Jesus' body, the body of Christ, was only spiritual because right. they, they didn't like the physical. Right. Sean is saying the body of Christ, the church, is all spiritual and has no physical reality whatsoever. And right. I made that comparison. I've tried very carefully not to hang labels on him and yet, I, I think we need to make the comparison that that's Gnostic. And one of the things that Sean has made very clear, uh, you know, he, he really has resented publicly anyone trying to put a label on him. But at the Inquisition, he's trying to press me, are you a Calvinist? He wants to hang a label on me. Right. And I was hesitant to answer that question because I've seen how he defines Calvinist. And then uh, at the thing the other night, he's pressing me about how I'm a Calvinist. And then his wife takes a mic and shoves it in my face. And why can't you be honest and tell us, are you a Calvinist? And then he, he uh, said this in his follow-up. Uh, we have a clip of that. Especially, uh, basically, it, he wants to be known for following what Calvinism really, truly is, pure Calvinism. I, on the other hand, reject almost all religious orthodoxy and believe that Christianity since 70 AD is subjectively lived and understood by individual believers by the power of the Holy Spirit working on individuals who have come to understand who Jesus is, of course, through missional efforts, sharing the word, very important. So I'm going to build my case for how I see Christianity in these terms on the show for this year. I'm really grateful, though, for the opportunity to engage with Pastor Wallace. So you go through that thing from two weeks ago. Calvin, Calvin, Calvinism, Calvin, Calvin, Calvinism, Calvinism. And it's yeah. like, now, I want, to, I want to play several clips here to give you a sense of what Sean means by Calvinism. Uh, so we have first here, this is from about a year and a half ago. If God has always existed everywhere, he's om, um, omnipresent. If God is all-powerful, if God is all-knowing, and if punishment after this life is eternal, Chris, then, this is the big if then, prior to doing anything, Chris, forming the earth, the heavens, animals, man, he knew completely and fully that some of his creations that had not been made yet were going to go to hell and burn there forever and ever and ever and ever. And he created them anyway. If that's the case, this means, Chris, he created them for hell. Now you can jump around it all you want, you can give me books and everything else, but in the end, you will have to agree with that premise. You can try and say all kinds of other things, but this is what the Calvinists believe. So uh, he goes on later to tell a little bit more about what he thinks Calvinists believe. Uh, we have our next clip here. Tonight we are going to embark on our study of five-point Calvinism and how Mormon doctrine is essentially a refutation of it which, in my opinion, is one of the reasons why Mormonism is so appealing to thinking people who can't understand a God who likes to create people as kindling for fires of hell. And so Joseph Smith and Mormonism were a direct result, partially at least, of the existence of Calvinism. Now the reality is that Joseph Smith hated 
Presbyterianism. He hated the doctrines of grace. He, uh, we are the only ones who get singled out. Uh, Methodist and the Baptist get mentioned as well, but uh, in Pearl of Great Price, Joseph Smith's History, Chapter 1, he tells his mother, I have learned from myself that Presbyterianism is not true. But Sean is presenting a caricature, and he, he's presenting what he considers to be a monster, and he's, he's clear that that's really what he believes about the God that we understand to exist. So uh, let me, let's just go ahead and play the other two clips back, um, back to back here. So my point is, here's the deal. Let's say for argument's sake that Mormonism... So my point is, here's the deal. Let's say for argument's sake that Mormonism decided tomorrow to embrace fully the five essentials of Christianity that we talked about. If they did, we ought to also embrace them into the body of Christ with all their variant and strange things that they that do and even believe in, as long as those core essentials are in place. When we argue all the extra stuff, it's just, just because that extra stuff points to their failure in the core essentials. But nevertheless, if they were to say, we do accept these five points, they would be no different as a sect in Christianity than five-point Calvinists, in my opinion. Their, their idea of who God is and, and everything else would be absolutely no more strange to me than what five-point Calvinists believe. In the face of five-point Calvinism, I, too, wonder what is better, what, what is out there that can answer the questions that the Calvinists bring forward as truth. There's got to be another way to see this than the five-point Calvinism's view because it's so heinous to me when I read about it that I don't relate to that God. The Mormon people, too, were like, what? You mean he actually, this God who, who John says is love, he actually creates people to burn in hell forever and ever and ever and is happy about that? Before they ever, ever exist, he has created them for hell and that's his good pleasure? You actually believe that? Joseph comes along and said, there's no way. God loves everybody. He's our heavenly father. Well, that makes more sense to me. And so we see how Calvinism influenced the formation of Mormonism from the get-go. And do we have one more clip in that series? Now, let me offset what you're saying to me with what you believe, which is that God sovereignly creates men and women to burn in hell. That that is his sovereignty, that he has them and he lets them live here, but it's his joy to have them burn in hell while his other chosen ones get to live in bliss. And he knew that before you were creating one single person. If you want to follow that God, have at it, but not me. According to Revelation 20, uh, Tom, do you know where the lake of fire is that hell and death are cast into? Do you know, Tom? Tell me. They're in the presence of the Lord. Did you know I that it says that, 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 that the lake of fire, that the lake of fire, where hell is, ca the occupants are thrown into, it burns in the presence of the Lord and His holy angels. Now, listen to me. The only way that we can view that is either the Lord is doing that for a purpose or he is enjoying the hell out of those guys frying. If you want to believe he's enjoying it while they're in his presence burning, go ahead. I don't. I believe in John that says God is love. Now, you had a radical conversion. I did. Uh, you, were, um, you were a drug dealer. I was. Uh, but staunch Mormon. <laughs> I certainly was. <laughs> but, I believed. You didn't have your temple recommend. No, I didn't. But we're, I we're believed. Tithing on it, but but you, 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 you believed in the system. Right. You had a radical conversion, and you start devouring the Bible. Right. You start tel talking to people about predestination that you see in, in Romans 8. Ephesians 2. Right, right. 
And people told you, that's not the Bible, that's Calvinism, didn't they? Yeah, they sure did. <laughs> uh, over, over years of me reading, I'd come across these passages where it would say that God had blinded these people. And I thought, wait a minute, I thought he was trying to save everybody. What's he doing blinding them so that they can't see the truth? And then I come across other texts where it says that uh, man is deaf, dumb, and blind. He's dead in his trespasses and sins. I come across other texts that says, there's none who seek after God. No, not one. There's none who understands. There's none who seek after God. And so by nature, we're children of wrath. And I, and I come across, who is man? And, and I've seen the, the sovereignty of God and how God is the one in whom chooses, not people, if it was up to man to choose God, then nobody gets saved. The scriptures talk about God's secret weapon, predestination, to save some. That the Bible clearly teaches this, that they were chosen before the foundation of the world. 1 Corinthians 1, God has chosen the weak and foolish things of this world. Right. No right. flesh should glory in his presence. Right. And so if we could boast... If I get there because of my decision, then I have something to boast about. If I get there by my good works, if so, anything I do to obtain this, I have something to boast about. But I was dead in my trespasses and sins. I wasn't seeking after God. In fact, when God showed up and I heard his word, I tried to run away. Good luck trying to get away and, from God. And why is it you believe and people who are smarter and stronger and nicer and better looking, kind of hard to picture. Why is it they don't believe and you do? The scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, that the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit, for they are foolishness unto him. And I would say, looking at that clip, that's right. You, no man by his nature will serve this true and living God in the scripture, the creator of all things, the sustainer, uh, they are going to look at him like that's ridiculous. But God's ways are not our ways. If Now, Sean, let me, let me say this off the first, that this is not to slam Sean's character. This is about truth claims. This has nothing to do with character. He seems like a fine guy. I'd like, he, he'd be fun to go fishing with or something. But when it comes to truth claims, the scripture says, defend the faith, which was once and for all delivered to the saints. I'm commanded by God to take a stand for him and his truth. And here's what we do, is we echo the word of God. The word of God says, this is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So anyway, the natural man can't even understand the things of the spirit of God. It has to be given to them. Apart from that, the natural man will not know. He'll come up with all kinds of crazy ideas. But you only believe that because somehow or another you got exposed to John Calvin, right? Well, that, that's <laughs> funny. I'm glad you mentioned that. <laughs> Praise the Lord you brought that up. Because I remember I was a pastor, and I was in this pastor's meeting in Salt Lake, and they introduced me as, the, we, here is... Kurt, our full-blown five-point Calvinist. And they kind of looked at me and, and they said, wow, that's really amazing that, that you're such an agreement with John Calvin. And I said, I have never read John Calvin, ever. Not one even sentence. I have never writ, read John Calvin anywhere. But I'm sure glad he agrees with me. <laughs> and they thought that was arrogant of me. <laughs> but... Uh, they got my point, I hope, well, that yeah, this but, but, comes from the scriptures. We don't follow John Calvin. We test John Calvin by the word of God. We test all things by the word of God. And if they are found wanting, then in love we tell them. And it's not that we're assassinating anybody's character, and that's what he made it out to be. And that has nothing to do with this at all. Basically, by hanging a label on us, I mean, do you go around, you know, rah, rah, I'm a Calvinist? No, and I don't call myself a Calvinist. I call myself a Bible-believing Christian. 
And now, historically speaking, you've got a lot of people who claim to be Bible-believing Christians. Right, right. And as a shorthand, there are people who are dispensationalist and will identify themselves as such. Right. Uh, there are people, the, you had the Arminian controversy. The remonstration. And, yeah. And right. so the, um, and they were clearly known as Arminians because they were following that. The right. response, a shorthand name was given to that by others. Uh, you know, no one picked it for themselves. But right. They, that's they, a good they, point. They called, they, they called the answer in terms of what do we call this? They said, well, that's Calvinism. Calvin had been dead for years, for decades. But Calvin wasn't the one who, who originates all this. No, he... Mar Martin Luther taught the exact same thing. That's, he? he surely did. And, exactly the same thing. And all through church history, you see people teaching the exact same thing, don't you? Right. And, you know, uh, uh, that's good that you brought that up because I remember three weeks ago when we were there uh, a nice lady stood up and said well if if Luther could come up with new things why can't we and I thought Luther didn't come up with anything new he brought us back to the scriptures instead of popes uh, purgatory indulgences etc he, he, he reformed the church back to the Word of God. And the, and the point, you know, Luther wasn't oblivious to this, but Luther, they, they pick on fringe things that Luther said because Luther is legitimately casting about saying, what other traditions have I not examined? But Luther wasn't the only Protestant reformer. Zwingli right, comes right. along the same identical time. Yep, yep. And there are numerous others and what they're doing, and what Luther ultimately does as well, is they see that what they're reading in the scriptures isn't new. It is historic Catholic Christianity. That, that is absolutely correct. Not Roman Catholic, but, 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 his, but, his, but there is a clear line of what, what did Chrysostom believe? about who is God, who is man, what is sin, who is Jesus Christ, what is salvation, right. what did Augustine, what did all these right. others. And not just, we're not basing it on a few individuals, but what did the church believe? There were times, and this is the thing, Sean creates this history where he said within a two-year period, I think he said 340 to 343, I may be off on the dates, but he said, more Christians killed each other over Trinity than the Roman Empire had killed in 250 years nearly of persecution. Now the reality is Constantine restores Arius to his position of presbyter, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. And the Arians take over positions of power and Athanasius, who defends Nicaea, a generation later is exiled under threat of death if he comes back to Alexandria and teaches what, what, what had been settled there. But Sean makes it out to be that the, 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 the forces of Nicaea were you know, persecuting these poor Christians and that we all want to burn him at the stake and kill him. Yeah. All because we say, here's a man who's teaching publicly and he's teaching grave error. That's all it is. That's all it is. That's nothing else. Well, if you'd like to join in the conversation, the phone number here is 801-973-8820. That's 801-973-8820. So, uh, what, they, what they try to dismiss as an ism by putting an, a label to it, it's Calvinism. Right. Uh, if you want, if you want to... If you want to use that as shorthand, I have no problem with it. But to go around, you know, I'm a Calvinist. You know, I, you know, that's my party. I'm a Paul. I'm a Paul. I'm a Calvin. You know? Right, right. That's insane. It is. And that's and Calvin would slap you upside the head. Calvin would be a very upset individual. So, uh, yeah, Sean comes out of a Ch Calvary Chapel background, which tends to demonize uh, Calvinism, mm -hmm. and. He, he plays that on the one hand, and yet then he comes and, and attacks the, the vision-casting pastors building their empires to sort of come at the other, the critics of Calvinists. <laughs> and he presents something that sounds very tempting. But I want to focus on, um, and we're not going to be able to get 
too far into this this evening, but there's a different, I mean, Sean says, if you want to follow that God, and I guess we need to flesh this out, uh, is God a sadistic monster for sending people to hell and leaving them there? Absolutely not. Not only is one of his attributes love, but one another of his attributes is justice, wrath, and that God is perfectly just to give somebody what they deserve. Yeah. Uh, how on earth could he be a monster if he sent me to hell? That's giving me what I deserve. Uh, the, 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 whole, the good news is, is I don't get what I deserve. Christ paid the penalty for me. He died in my place on Calvary's cross. He, his first question out of the box for me was, he quoted Calvin as saying, there's a span of babies in hell. I've never and, heard that. Yeah, and I, I, I went on the internet, I found a number of anti-Calvinists quoting it, but even some of them were admitting they couldn't find yeah. the citation, sort of like the, the citation about all these Christians killing each other over Trinity. Right, right. Um, um, facts also seem to... Uh, Fail Sean when he was talking about how we're a bunch of ivory tower intellectuals that uh, you have to have a PhD. Well, I'm certainly glad that the lack of my education came in handy finally. <laughs> <laughs> and, and let me comment. I mean, for those who haven't seen it, Sean says you have to have a PhD or you know a higher degree or, or at least a bachelor's, um, you know, because they're you know a bunch of ivory tower intellectuals. And you know, how does this serve the thing? And I'm just laughing. I was sitting there just thinking, if you only knew. And he's he, and he's like you know. You know, you're laughing, you know it's true, and I'm looking at you. Uh, what was the highest grade you finished? I, I finished ninth grade. But unlike so many others, rather than boasting in your ignorance, you actually fed on that, didn't you? Hey, when I first got saved, uh, in fact, when I went in the United States military, they told me that I had a second grade education that I could read at the second grade level. And uh, I learned to read by reading the scriptures. Uh, I just, every day, <laughs> just gobbling it up. Uh, of course, if I'd have had a good teacher, if I'd have had a good church that would have steered me along, would have saved me a lot of time. But you, but you found brothers that loved you, cared about you, were willing to work with you. And... Ordinarily, in the OPC, it is expected that you have a bachelor's degree and a master's of divinity. Oh, clearly, clearly. And and we probably have more PhD pastors than yeah. a whole host of. He was right in that regard, and I give him kudos for saying, "Okay, hey, I was wrong. I stand corrected." And so that's good but, that he did that. But um, yeah, he he says we're talking about a different God. He's not going to follow the God. Who right. sends people to hell. And, and he is right. We are talking about a different God. And so why on earth would he say, we're brothers, we're Christians too. Why are we even here? I, I see on the board we've got a caller. Uh, I think I know who this is. Uh, uh, we have, have Dale with us from Magna. Dale, good to have you with us. Hello? Dale? Hello, Dale. Hello, Dale. Are you on the air? You're on the air. Pardon? You're on the air. Go ahead. Am I at this section? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I want to stand behind what I said at the Inquisition, and that is that I said to, to Sean that he was still LDF. And he couldn't argue that fact. It is a fact. All the stuff now is so different. Now, one of the things on Calvinism, I am a single Baptist pastor. I am, I thought, do not follow Calvin. Um, Arminius, was, who was the contemporary of Calvin, I was, I considered Arminian in theology. But on the basis of, of what salvation is, on, on eternity, on hell, I have no problem with, with Calvinism on that at all. But I will tell you now, I, I honestly believe that Sean has stepped over a line into her not just a heresy, but to apostasy. 
Dale, you're, uh, you're Dale, you're an Arminian. I'm sorry. You're an Arminian. I am. Do you believe that God creates people knowing that they're going to hell? I do not believe he created people for that purpose. I have to also point out that if God dwells in eternity, which is a sliver, a kindness and a sliver of eternity, well, of course God knows the end. He also sees the beginning and the end. So did he plan it? I, I don't know that. Um, but but, but hell is... I'm not sure, honestly, that anyone can really totally know that, but to say that God, God purpose to send people to hell, no. People still have evaded their place by their belief and their lack of belief. Um, I think they, you and I would agree that it takes the same part. Conversion. It's not just a choice, well, today I'm going to get saved. No. It has to be a perfect process where God, if the God initiates it, we have to respond. Appreciate the call, Dale. Okay. Thank Take you. Care. Bye -bye. Okay, bye bye. You know, you have to ask the question if, if you want to, if Sean is so repulsed, where was the love of God when he drowned every baby on this planet? Um, and by the way, the quote. Uh, I, I called the Meter Center for Calvin Studies at Calvin College, mm -hmm. and I asked them, have you ever seen this, quote, anywhere? And they said, we've never seen it anywhere. It's been a, you know, there are people who, who seem to have said that he said it, but, but no one, but it's nowhere in any of his writings. It seems to be something that was made up. Yeah. Are there babies in hell? The Bible doesn't tell me. That's right. And so I don't go where the Bible doesn't go. But is the way broad, uh, the gate wide that leads to destruction? Yes. Right. And he's, where was the love of God in the flood? Where was the love of God in, in, in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah? Where was the love of God when he tells the Israelites to kill every man, woman, and child of the, of the Canaanites? He tells Saul explicitly to kill every man, woman, child, and suckling infant. The reality is, it's not just etern eternality of hell that Sean is going to have a problem with if he goes down this road. He's rationalized that hell can't be eternal because God is love. Yeah. Yep. But where is the love of God in all these things? I think he's, I, I'm afraid he's on a, the road to, uh, I mean, to Sean's credit, I think Sean is, is symptomatic of a whole lot of people's thinking. I think you're right. But Sean tries to, to back up where his commitments. He's, I think he starts off in error and he just compounds that error. But Sean has the boldness to say what a lot of other people may think, but they won't go there. And my fear for Sean, uh, maybe this Maybe he won't go there, but he's arguing like an atheist, isn't he? How can a good God create such an evil world? Well, there's sin. Okay, but how do we deal with a God who sends people to hell for any length of time? Where's the love of God there? He's not vindicating God by saying God eventually lets them out of hell. Uh, he, he gave this little... Um, thing the, the the burning toilet of death or of hell I think it was um, you know where basically hell was God's way of making us finally reach out for Him. He talks about the lake of fire in Revelation 20. Revelation 14 says that they are tormented in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb, and mm. the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. Right. Revelation 6, the kings, the great ones, all the people of the earth cry out to the mountains, fall on us and hide us from the wrath of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Right. For the great day of his wrath has come and who can stand? Right. God is just as much a God of wrath as he is God of love. And you can't pit one against the other. No, you cannot. We're going to squeeze in some calls here. Uh, we have with us uh, Summers uh, from Salt Lake City. Summers, good to have you with us. Yes. You're on the air. Okay. Hello? 
you're on the air. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Uh, Mrs. Summers, and I want to let you know I'm on your side. I don't like what Sean McCraney says. And in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, uh, 19, it says, Do not entertain accusations against the elders unless it's brought by two or three witnesses. That's right. Those who sin are to be rebuked publicly so that others may take warning. I charge you in the sight of God and Christ Jesus to, and the elect angels to keep these instructions without partiality and do nothing out of favoritism. Do not be hasty in laying on the hands and do not charge the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. And um, I just wanted to let you know, hell is eternal, and people who never repent and are in their wickedness and they don't turn to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and totally reject Him are the ones that will go to hell for all eternity. And that's just my comment. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Summers. You know, Sean, uh, he, he had a cartoon uh, a couple of weeks ago on his show where he had a picture of Jesus saying, uh, let me in, I have good news, and this is a bad paraphrase, but uh, what news? Um, the, the good news of, uh, or, you know, you can be saved. Saved from what? Saved from what I'll do to you if you don't let me in. <laughs> <laughs> and it just, he, he, he loved that. And it's, we have a very, very different view. We're running out of time here. We don't have, we're going to have more to get to next week. But it's, who is this God? And what is this gospel? He says, we've all received the same gospel. No, we haven't. That's right. And he's turned it into believe in love. Believe in love, he says. But what does it mean to believe, according to the scriptures? Someone who is living as a homosexual, according to 1 Corinthians 6 or Galatians 5, do they really believe? Right. Answer is no. Otherwise, it would be changed. And if they struggle with it, that's a different story than practicing it and living in it. Yes. And... You know, what is your answer? Uh, you, you've, uh, you know, some of us led shelter, you know, had sheltered childhoods, and uh, you know, my sins were more in here and in here. Uh, Mine were out there. Yeah, <laughs> you were know, my older brother. Uh, yeah, he 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 was the bad kid. I was the good kid until the Lord opened my eyes and showed me I was worse than he ever dreamt of being. Uh, because apart from the grace of God, I, I was a monster. Right, right. But these people, they would not hear that there are sins that are barometers, that, that God does change us, and there are certain sins that are signs to us. Just as homosexualism, I mean, homosexual behavior was a spe special judgment of God in Romans 1, there are sins that are, are indicators our hearts haven't been changed. And they're just like, who are you to judge? Right. Well, and, and haven't you broken the law? Who, who are you? Right. When we're not really, we're not doing anything other than echoing the Word of God. That's what we're doing. We're saying, but look, this is what the Scriptures say. And the Word of God cannot err. It is trustworthy in all its parts. And it is worthy for us to uh, place our eternal souls in the balance of the Old and the New Testaments. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of time left here. One of the things Sean has been driving is that all these, there's all these divisions because we're trying to apply the Bible to our own day. And that if we just would just give everybody liberty that, and all get along, then, you know, then we'd have this golden age and kids would take the Bible seriously. In, in 30 seconds, how would you respond to that? Oh, uh, as far as everybody getting together and singing Kumbaya is... is yeah, I mean, basically the idea is that th the divisions are that we're taking something that was only for that day and we're trying to apply it to our own day. Yeah, well, when you can take and you can do away with the Word of God anywhere in Scripture, you are on a slippery slope. You cannot get away with doing away with Holy Scripture. This is, 
man don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds forth from the mouth of God. This is our spiritual nourishment. This is what we live off of. Uh, and so we need to relate that... We're out of time here, but I, I want to comment briefly. You know, let, let me say... Uh, I, I, I count you as one of my best brothers, and I, I rejoice that you tremble at God's word, and you've done the hard work. Uh, you know it better than a whole than most PhDs I know, uh, and uh, you may not know a lot of minutia that they might know in things, but you know the Lord, you know His word, and you want to be faithful. Anyway, thank you so much for being with us. Um, I'm the pastor of Christ Presbyterian Church here in the Salt Lake Valley. This is Curtis Eggleston, the pastor of Berean Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Ogden. We invite you to worship with us Sunday mornings, 11 a.m., 8630 West, 2700 South Main Street, Magna, or at 9 a.m. at 3350 Harrison Boulevard in Ogden. For more information, go to gospelutah.org or call us at 801-969-7948. Till next week, we wish you the Lord's greatest blessings. Good night. Yeah.